I want to bring some power to this room. If you would, please raise your hands with me. Wide and high. And perhaps even do this when you are on the podium or when you have won. These days, we show our power when we've moved ahead of others, when we are winning or have won. We don't show our power when we are collaborating or when we are doing anything good together. Today, I'd like to talk to you about a power within us, the power of empathy and compassion. And it is with this power of empathy and compassion that we may progress sustainably as one humanity. So my story begins when I was a 15-year-old. My mom comes in and passed me this newspaper article, and it profiles the Singaporean Olympians that are heading towards the 1988 Olympic Games. My short-term objective for the Games was to do the best time and to break my national records. But my long-term ambition was to drive a Ferrari and to live in a bungalow with a swimming pool. And why not? I grew up in Singapore. And not unlike in other countries, fast developing countries, we were constantly reminded that the matrix of progress and success were material attainments. And in Singapore, we all know so well the five C's, cash, car, credit card, condo, and country club. And we think that we're moving ahead, and we're progressing when we have attained them. I would say that most of my friends, the same generation at that point in time, we all shared similar ambitions. And it is precisely this mindset, this mindset of self-centeredness, of greed, that led us to the global financial crisis in 2008. And this is where I'll raise my hands up again. And I'll say, Mia culpa, I was part of the problem. I remember one evening at dinner with my father, he passed me a brochure, a structured product. And he said, son, I put my retirement money into this. My chest tightened up. And I recognized the product. It was exactly like the ones that my team and I manufactured. We sold them on to financial institutions who repackaged them and resold them to the man on the street, the mom and pops, and to my dad. And in normal circumstances, it would be okay. But as we headed into the global financial crisis, many moms and pops lost all of their retirement monies. Fast forward to today, 2021, COVID, a zoonotic disease transferred from animal to humans. Someone decided one day that was a good idea to eat an exotic wild bat. This virus spread wild throughout the world. It's infected close to 150 million people, and it's taken the lives of 3 million but during this time, what we are seeing is this self-centered greed come out and arise. We see capitalism rear its ugly head. In some countries, you see money and power being used as tools to help folks move ahead of the line, ahead of the vaccination line this self-cherishing attitude. It has no space for virtuous action and no space to help others. But I have hope. I'm optimistic because of the millennials and the Gen Z. 
they hold us accountable. They value purpose over profit. They're morally anchored and ethically conscious. Our children, the new generation, are our greatest teachers. Just a few weeks back, I bought a paraben-free shampoo, and I was so proud to show it to my family. And my youngest immediately turned around to say, Dad, did you know that they do animal testing? I recognized my ignorance. I had no idea. But at the same time, I was inspired and optimistic because of their knowledge, their wisdom at this very young age. I'm also inspired by the new breed of conscious investors. They're collaborating in the power of empathy and compassion, greatly influencing their family wealth, removing investments that are misaligned, and crafting portfolios that are authentically aligned with their values. They are also very conscious in their consumption because every single cent that they spend, they know is a vote for the company with which they buy from. Now these conscious investors, they do so because they want to do good while making money. But very importantly, they are convinced that they can make a lot of money while doing good. Luckily for me, a bunch of ev events happened that helped me change my worldview. I bring it back to when I was 15 years old. I'm in the holding room, and I see all these well-trained swimmers around me. I even noticed the Olympic champion, the last one, just two seats away from me. My palms are sweating. This is the epitome of sport. Every amateur athlete dreams of arriving here. I'm 15 and I'm here. Seoul, Korea, 1988. They usher me and usher us out to our lanes. As I walk towards my lane, I take a look at the black line that goes across to the end of the pool. I take off my Olympic tag and put it in the basket, my tracksuit, and I put on my goggles. I walk to the front, to the pool, and I splash some water on me. This is a ritual that I've done many, many times. But this time, it feels different. The water is particularly cold, and I feel a shiver down my spine. I hear the announcer introduce us to competitors for the 400 individual medley. And as I hear my name, I see in the distance, in the spectator sand, my parents waving frantically. I wave back. And I force a nervous smile. I hear a whistle, and I jump out on the starting block. And I realize my legs are shaking. I can barely balance. Take your mark. I bend over like a recalled spring, ready to go. It's all silent right now except for the beating of my heart. Bang! We take off. And before we enter the water, I hear the roaring, thunderous sound of the crowd. It's powerful and it's energizing. And when I enter the water, it feels like an out-of-body experience. The 400 individual medley is known to be the most gruesome and grueling event in swimming. But I enjoy it. And as I do, 
the first 100 meters butterfly. I'm feeling strong and I'm enjoying myself. And then when I turned for my backstroke, I was quite concerned because the backstroke is not such a good stroke for me. It's my weakest. But I feel like I'm kept keeping up. And finally, I take a turn for the third hundred, which is for the breaststroke. And this is where I have so much fun. The breaststroke is my favorite stroke. And I put more energy, more power into it. And I feel like I'm catching up. I can see at the side of my eyes. Finally, it's the final 100 meters. And that's the freestyle. As I push off, an Im immense wave of lactic acid just hits me. And it almost paralyzes me. And I say, Des, you got to keep going. And I push on. And I push on. The final turn, 25 meters left. I'm grasping for air. I'm out of air. I'm literally taking a breath in every stroke I take. But the last 10 meters, I put my head down and I power to the end. I'm breathless. <laughs> and the only thing I can think about right now is whether I've done the best I can. I look up to the board, to the timing board, and I see my time up there. And it looks like I've done the best time I've ever done in my life. But shortly after, it changes to a D. I struck it off. I thought it was a glitch, Desmond D. So I make the front page news. Imagine a 15-year-old teenager, eyes of an entire nation on me, celebrated as the prince of the pool, someone who would change the face of swimming and sport in Singapore. But instead, I make my mark, my Olympic debut, with a big disqualification. This is, just, this is just the first of numberless mistakes I make in my life. But it changes me. For the next 10 years or so, I continue swimming, two more Olympic Games, and 20 years of finance career. But I have learned so much from all the mistakes that I've made. It's not about winning or the podium. It's really about embracing failures, celebrating breakthroughs. It's about commitment. It's about tenacity. It's about the practice. For me, it's about the friendship. It's about humans. And it's about walking together in the power of empathy and compassion as a tribe. It's not about winning at all costs. I know because I have hurt myself and others along the way when I do so. I feel like I'm a hamster on a hamster wheel, running, chasing, but I never really get there. And if we continue this way, we head to a world with a lot more inequality and a lot more suffering. I know it's not easy, and I lose sight often. Just last week, we had a rehearsal for this talk, and I was focused on crafting a winning speech the winning talk. And I lost sight of things. But we get reminders along the way. 
during the rehearsal, I got a a nerving phone call. I dropped everything and I rushed off. I, I remember my palms sweating and my heart beating. As I reached home, before I reached home, I saw the flashing lights greeting me. And when I arrived, my daughter in the front seat of the ambulance and my wife in the back, tended to by paramedics. This is a beautiful reminder to me of the preciousness of our human life. And while we are on this earth, let us make meaningful choices. With that, may I invite everyone to raise your hands again. Please join me. But this time, please place it on your heart. May we walk in our power of empathy and compassion. And may we focus our power to progress sustainably to benefit our 7.8 billion people on this one planet that we share.